Hi again. I'm still Charlotte Aten, and this is going to be part two of week two of my series of talks on universal algebra and lattice theory. And so today I will be talking about congruences of algebras and quotient algebras. So as always, let me bring up my slides and uh, figure out where my uh, annotation stuff is run off to and make sure that I have the right color and we are all set. Okay, so uh, as I said, I'm going to be talking about congruences and quotients today. So uh, in particular, I will be talking about relations which I need in order to discuss kernels of functions. It's going to turn out that kernels of homomorphisms of algebras are quite special and we'll call them congruences. Congruences will allow us to define quotient algebras. And then we can take a step back and talk about the relationship between our concepts of uh, kernel and congruence and the perhaps more familiar formulation of these ideas in group theory after which we will at last be able to uh, prove the first of the isomorphism theorems uh, or the homomorphism or factor theorem, if you will, for general algebraic structures. So then we will have proven uh, the theorem, which goes by many different names, but which is usually the first uh, such theorem proved in the theory of groups and rings and modules and things but we can just prove all of those results simultaneously today near the end. And finally, we'll talk about generating congruences and we'll see that that is, uh, has very strong parallels with generating subuniverses, which we did previously this week. So to get started, we need to define relations. So if we have some set A and some natural number N, we refer to a subset of A to the N as a relation on A of arity N, or as an n airy relation on A. Now, one needs to be careful because if I have an n airy operation taking A to the N uh, to A for some whole number N, which may be zero, then I can think of the graph of F, which we usually denote like this, as being a subset of a to the n plus one, but this is an n plus one airy, n plus one airy uh, relation. And so uh, we don't need to actually use that correspondence right now. And if you're not familiar with what the graph of an n airy operation is, um, well, it's very similar to what the graph of uh, a function is from uh, the set A to itself. And uh, just something, a warning I wanted to throw out there later on when we uh, do a lot more with n area relations, um, one has to be careful of the distinction between the arity of a relation and the arity of an operation. Okay, but maybe we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves. We're mostly going to focus in this talk on relations of arity too which are also called binary relations. As always, as is the uh, story of many things, the binary version is uh, privileged and is considered uh, before the more general case. So we'll see uh, more general relations on another day. And they'll come in in a slightly different context. So there are a number of ways of getting new binary relations from old ones. Uh, given binary relations theta and psi on a set A, we have that the intersection of theta and psi, as well as the union of theta and psi, are also binary relations on A. And this simply follows uh, from the fact that uh, binary relation on A is nothing other than a subset of A squared. And so if theta is a subset of A squared and psi is a subset of A squared, then of course the intersection and union of these two sets are also subsets of A squared. All right. So we also have slightly fancier ways of forming new binary relations from old ones. Uh, so if we have 
two binary relations, again, say theta and psi on A. Then we define the relative product of theta and psi by saying that it consists of all the pairs xz, where there's some y in A, so that xy is in theta and yz is in psi. And so if we want to picture this, maybe I'll draw this down here, uh, we can imagine that we have uh, three copies of our set A, and then we have uh, theta is some relation and psi is some other relation. And so if these points represent my elements of A, oh, I'm drifting off the side of the screen here, okay. Um, so then if these guys represent my elements of A, so this is one copy of my set, this is another copy, and this is the third copy, and they're not bumping into each other, then I have some subset of uh, the collection of pairs, which I can view as a given pair, I can view as a line segment that connects two of the points in these sets. And so similarly, I have another relation, psi A over here, which has a similar thing going on. And so this is some subset of the collection of pairs. Now, in order to have a pair XZ be in the relative product of theta and psi, I need there to be some Y in uh, this middle copy of A, so that if I start off at X and I travel over to Y, then I can find a pair in psi here so that yz is in that pair. So in this picture, we would have that xz is in the relative product because there's at least one y so that I can go from x to y and then y to z. All right, so now uh, it's okay if there are many such y. It's fine if you can also go from x to here and then from here to here. That's fine too, as long as there's at least one. Uh, now, for example, if I had um, this different x over here and this z over here, um, maybe this x is connected to this one, that there's this pair x, y, but maybe this y um, doesn't uh, meet the c. And moreover, maybe any y that I choose, which actually can only be this one in this example because x isn't joined with anybody else, there's no way to get from x to some y and then over to z according to theta and then psi. And so, this pair xz would not belong to the relative product. So you can really visualize it as just saying that there's at least one path in this picture which starts at your x and ends at your z. If that's the case, then xz is in the relative product. And so uh, note that while this is very similar to function composition, you've probably seen a similar picture for the composition of functions. Uh, note that actually uh, this is in the opposite, this is written in the opposite order. So when we, when we look at the composite of two functions g of f, this is often defined as the set of all xz so that there exists some y so that f of, well, okay, we don't even need, we, or well, okay, I guess we do. So, uh, so there exists some y so that f of x is equal uh, to y and uh, g of uh, g of y is equal uh, to z. And you can also write this out in terms of the corresponding binary relations for those functions. And so the point here is that if we uh, did the composition of two functions according to that law, which is also denoted by a circle as its binary uh, operation symbol, then we would actually apply this, the second listed relation, say first, and then the first one. With the relative product, it's the opposite way. So here's another, here's another instance where I'm warning you to be careful. Uh, the relative product has the same notation as the usual composite functions, but the order is reversed. So that's always something to watch out for, and hopefully it will always be clear from context which of these two things is occurring. Okay, so we also have a unary operation on binary relations on A. We have a way of taking a single binary relation, say theta, 
on A and producing a new binary relation, the converse of theta, where we define theta converse to be the collection of all pairs yx so that xy belongs to theta. Now, this is denoted by theta superscript smile, this uh, little symbol, which looks like this, if I draw it bigger. Uh, this symbol is called a smile, which is nice and pleasant and happy. <laughs> now, uh, as a final bit of notation, we often write x theta y instead of x y in theta when theta is a binary relation. Um, and that's because of usual notation where we have things like x less than or equal to y, or just x equals, so, equals y, or um, x is um, approximately y. And so in many areas of math, we use binary relations uh, like this, where we put the relation as an infix in between the two uh, members of that pair. All right. So in particular, we're often concerned with the following type of binary relation. An equivalence relation is a binary relation in some set A, uh, where for all x, y, and z in A, we have that x is always related to itself. If I have, which is the reflexive property, as it's called. We also have the symmetric property, where if x is related to y, then y must be related to x. And finally, we have the transitive property, where if x is related to y and y is related to z, then x must also be related to z. If these three properties hold for a given binary relation theta, that relation is called an equivalence relation on the set A. So we're going to denote by eq of A uh, the set of all equivalence relations on the set A. We're going to define zero for A to be the set of all pairs xx so that x is in A and one on a to be just a squared. So zero a and one a are equivalence relations on a, and it's fairly direct to verify that those satisfy those three axioms of reflexivity, symmetry, and transitivity that I mentioned before. Now, for any, uh, any equivalence relation theta, we actually have that zero for a is contained in theta is contained in one for a. Uh, so this certainly isn't true for a general uh, relation on A, or general binary relation on A, but for equivalence relations, it is true. So we can think of uh, zero as being the smallest um, equivalence relation that we could define on A, and one as being the biggest equivalence relation that we could define on A. So when theta is an equivalence relation, we might also use special notation where we write x uh, so three lines instead of two. Uh, so x is um, equivalent to y mod theta. So this is uh, terminology that you might have seen when discussing equivalence classes uh, in the rings of the integers mod n for some natural number n. Or we might also write x is equivalent with theta subscripted here to y, rather than the notations we already introduced, which are x theta y, or the very set theoretic uh, sort of basic <laughs> notation, which is the pair x, y belongs to the set theta. OK, but these all mean the same thing. And we'll usually only use these when we're talking about an equivalence relation theta, as opposed to a more generic relation theta, which for which we might use uh, this other uh, notation we already introduced. So now that we have uh, some more notation, we can actually rewrite our definition, which is something, uh, as you've already seen at this point, that we like to do. Uh, we can rewrite our definition of an equivalence relation a little more symbolically. So a binary relation theta on a set A is an equivalence relation when, well, we can actually express reflexivity as saying that the zero equivalence relation is contained in our particular one, theta. Symmetry becomes the condition that theta smile, or the converse of theta, is contained in theta. And transitivity is nothing but the condition that theta uh, relative product with itself 
uh, is contained in theta. And so it will sometimes be convenient to think about the definition of an equivalence relation in terms of uh, these operations we have on general binary relations on the set A. Now that we have uh, binary relations fairly established, uh, we can associate to each function a binary relation in the following way. So if I have a function f from a set A to another set B, uh, the kernel of f is the binary relation, which we denote by cur of f, uh, which consists of all pairs x, y, and a squared, so that f of x is the same element of b as f of y. This is the kernel of the function f. It itself is a set of pairs which belong, whose entries belong to A, and so the kernel of f is certainly a binary relation on A. We actually always have that the kernel of f is an equivalence relation on A for any possible function f. That's also a fairly direct verification that I will leave to you. Now, it's reasonable to ask, is every equivalence relation uh, the kernel of some function? So if I just start off with some equivalence relation uh, theta that belongs to my collection of equivalence relations on A, uh, does there exist some function f so that the kernel of f is equal to theta? Is this possible to accomplish for some choice of f, whatever it needs to be? Well, if you, really wanna, if you really want to challenge yourself and you have never seen uh, what is about to happen before, I uh, would invite you to uh, perhaps pause and think about it for a little while. Um, of course, I am just a recording now in your machine, and so I don't have the ability to really make you do anything. But uh, I would encourage you occasionally to stop and try to uh, think about how you would do something before I show you how to do it. And so, uh, you know, far be it for me to tell you what to do, but uh, I think it's a good suggestion if you're actually learning this for the first time. All right, so it turns out, okay, so yeah, that was, that was the time that you should have paused or whatever. So it turns out that the answer is yes. Uh, so given an equivalence relation theta on the set A, and some little a in our set A, we define the equivalence class of A modulo theta to be the set which we denote by A slash or mod theta, which consists of all the x's in the set A so that A is related to x by theta. Okay, so now we're going to use these in order to help us construct a function so that theta is the kernel of that function. So first of all, note that the collection of all the equivalence classes, a mod theta, is a partition of the set A. And that's another way that you may have seen before at some point to think about equivalence relations on the set A. So we're going to denote by big A mod theta the set of all of those equivalence classes, or in other words, that partition of A and we're going to refer to it as the quotient of the set A by the equivalence relation theta. Now, we're going to define a function that sought after function that we wanted on the previous page, uh, Q theta, which maps A to the quotient of A by theta, where we're going to define Q theta of A to be nothing but the equivalence class of A mod theta. And so, it's also a fairly direct verification that the uh, kernel of Q theta is precisely the equivalence relation theta. And so by this explicit construction, it is actually the case that every equivalence relation is the kernel of some function. And so these two concepts are precisely the same, uh, the same thing in the sense that we just described here. Okay, so it turns out uh, that kernels of homomorphisms of algebras always have some additional structure that isn't present 
in uh, just generic equivalence relations. So in order to describe precisely what that structure is, we need some more language. If we have an algebra A and some binary relation theta on just the underlying set, the universe of A, then first of all, we say that theta has the substitution property with respect to the algebra A, uh, when for each n-ary basic operation f of A and all possible values of x1 through xn, y1 through yn, so that each of the xi, yi are related by theta, um, we have that f of x1 through xn is related to f of y1 through yn. That's what it means to have the substitution property. Or in other words, maybe I will do it in the margin over here. Oh yeah, I guess that still shows up pretty well. Okay, so I don't know why I've always been so terrified of writing in the margins. It's like I want to keep it on the, I'm going to keep it on the slide, but I, I don't really need to do that because this records too. All right, in any case, I'm going to write in the margin. <laughs> so, uh, so what we have is the following situation x1, x2, blah, 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 up through xn. Those are, some, those are some elements of our set A. We have some other elements, y1, y2, blah, 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 up through yn. These are also elements of A. x1 is related to y1 by theta, x2 is related to y2, and xn is related to yn. Now, if we have this situation, what the substitution property says is that if we apply f to this column, so f of the tuple x1, x2, up through xn, f of x1, blah, blah, blah. And then we do the same thing and take f of y1, y2, up through yn, f of y1, blah, blah, blah. Then these two will also be related by theta. So that's not something that's guaranteed to happen for a typical equivalence relation. However, if it does happen that when you apply f to each of these two columns and you can still put this relation theta between, see, you can still see that these two resulting elements are related by theta, that means that this equivalence relation has the substitution, or that this binary relation, it doesn't have to be an equivalence relation, but that this binary relation has the substitution property. I'm jumping ahead of myself, excuse me. Yeah. The substitution property is a property that any binary relation can hold. Um, it might not always hold for a given binary relation, but for some binary relations, it's true that the substitution property holds. Okay, so, uh, so now the second definition that we need is that, it, is that we say theta is a congruence of A when theta has both the substitution property and is also an equivalence relation on A. So equivalence relations which have this special substitution property, which allows you to do essentially what I've pictured over to the left here, that uh, those equivalence relations are uh, called, con those special equivalence relations are called congruences. And so as we'll see, congruences are going to play in universal algebra the same role that normal subgroups play in group theory and that ideals play in the theory of rings. So the kernel of any homomorphism, indeed any function, uh, is an equivalence relation. We already had talked about that previously. Using the definition of a homomorphism, we'll see that the kernel of each homomorphism has the substitution property and is thus a congruence. And so uh, in order to see this, let's suppose that um, Okay, so let's say that theta is the uh, kernel of H, where H is some homomorphism from an algebra A to an algebra B. Okay, so in order to check the substitution property, first I need to go, okay, well I have, uh, okay, so maybe I'll do this over here again. I have X1 related to, y1 
x2 related to y2 and da, 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 xn is related to yn. Now, if I have this situation, this is actually the same thing as having that h of x1 is equal to h of y1, h of x2 is equal to h of y2, and so on and so forth through h of xn is equal to h of yn. And that's just by the definition of the kernel of a function. Now let's actually use that h is a homomorphism of algebras. So let's fix some n-ary operation f among our basic operations, where as always a is this algebra a f. So if I have some n-ary basic operation, then by definition of a homomorphism, if I, uh, so if I look at h of f computed in a, apply to x1 through xn, well, that's actually the same thing as f computed in b of h of x1 through h of xn. But then, by assumption, because this is the assumption that I need to start with in order to check if my algebra has, or if my, <laughs> or if my relation has the substitution property, then I, I know that H1, H of x1 is equal to H of y1, even though x1 and y1 might be two different elements of my universe. So then this is the same as F in B of H of y1 through H of yn which using the fact that H is a homomorphism from A to B again, is the same thing as H of F computed in A of Y1 through Yn. But notice that having these two equal, H of F of A, F in A of these guys, and H of F in A of these guys, that means that since we have these, that means that if I take f or f computed in A of x1 through blah, 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 that's related according to theta, the kernel of H, that's related to f computed in A of y1 through yn. And this is precisely what we needed to show happened whenever we had this situation in order to show that the relation theta has the substitution property. And so this is the verification that if we have the kernel of a homomorphism of algebras, that kernel uh, has the substitution property. And since it's the kernel of a function, it's also an equivalence relation. And so that's precisely what it means for, uh, for this kernel, which we named theta, <laughs> to be a congruence of the algebra A. So, that's all well and good. The kernel of um, any homomorphism is a congruence, as we just checked. Uh, so now we have the same type of question that we had before. Is every congruence the kernel of a homomorphism? Or are the kernels of homomorphisms more special than just being any congruence? And so again, I would like to invite you to try to pause the video and figure that out for yourself, especially if you've never done it before. I think trying to do it first might be a good exercise. All right. So again, the answer is yes. We can show uh, we can show that this is true by turning the quotient map that we already had, this Q theta from A to uh, the quotient of A by theta, into a homomorphism. But in order to do that, we need to actually define an algebra, which we'll call A mod theta, the algebra A mod theta, or quotient out by theta, uh, with universe, the quotient of A by theta, uh, so that Q theta 
is actually a homomorphism from our algebra A that we started with uh, to this other algebra, which we created from A and the congruence theta. So if we have any basic NRE operation symbol F in some A1 through AN in our universe, then we need that Q theta applied to F computed in A of A1 through AN is F computed in whatever this algebra is, which we have yet to define, of Q theta of A1 through Q theta of AN. Now, by definition of Q theta, remember, Q theta of A was, by definition, the equivalence class of A mod theta. And so we actually require then, by applying the definition of Q theta, that the equivalence class of F of the AI is actually, is actually going to be the value of F computed in A mod theta of the equivalence classes of the AI mod theta. So we can actually take this as our definition of F computed in A mod theta. In other words, we say that this, this value is defined to be so this is actually defined to be the equivalence class of F computed in A and applied to each of the A1 through AN. So a uh, natural question at this point might be, is this well-defined? Because if you notice, this is the equivalence class of say A1 mod theta here. That's the equivalence class of A1, but we could have chosen any other representative of that equivalence class. So if we had that, uh, for example, um, this was also the same thing as uh, B1 mod theta, because A and B, A1 and B1 were in the same equivalence class. And say we chose other representatives up through Bn for these equivalence classes, then it might be natural to wonder whether we still get the same value if we instead compute this according to these representatives instead. So from this definition, we would have that this is F computed in A of B1 through Bn, and then the equivalence class of that mod theta. And so then the question is, are these two equivalence classes the same? Is this equivalence class the same as this equivalence class? Well, we had assumed that A1 and B1 we're in the same class, mod theta, and so we're A2 and B2 up through AN and BN. And so the substitution property actually tells us precisely that this is the case. <laughs> and so it turns out that we do have a well-defined function or a well-defined binary operation, F computed in A mod theta, uh, which is given by this calculation on the representatives. So it actually doesn't matter what we choose for our representatives of our equivalence classes, mod theta, we'll always get the same uh, value for any uh, given set of representatives for the same equivalence classes. So that's a very long way of saying that this is a well-defined operation. So we're all ready to go. Now we're ready to discuss quotient algebras. So, <laughs> The algebras A mod theta, uh, given by the preceding construction, whose basic operations I just described and argued were well-defined, those are going to be very important to us. So we're going to name them. I've been saying A mod theta in analogy with a notation that you may have seen before. Uh, but our more formal definition is given an algebra A and some congruence theta, which remember is an equivalence relation with the special substitution property, which makes it compatible with the operations of A. We say that the quotient algebra of the algebra A by theta is the algebra which is similar to A, whose universe consists of the equivalence classes of A mod theta, and where for each basic NRE operation symbol F and each A1 through AN in A, we define that basic operation as we just discussed. And now, a priori, this value on the right-hand side could depend on the AI, how, or on the, the choice of representatives AI for these equivalence classes, 
because these equivalence classes can be written with other representatives. However, because theta is a congruence, not just some equivalence relation, being a congruence gives us precisely that this is a well-defined operation, regardless of which representatives we choose for our equivalence classes that we plug into F in the quotient algebra A mod theta. All right. So uh, for some examples of congruences, we actually always have that, that zero and one are congruences for any algebra A. Before we had only seen that they were equivalence relations, but it's also a fairly straightforward argument that zero and one are also always congruences, no matter what the algebra is on the universe A on which these guys are equivalence relations. Moreover, if we form the quotient algebra of A, any algebra A, by its zero equivalence relation, we just get another algebra isomorphic to A. And that's just because this zero equivalence relation, remember, just consists of all the pairs xx. The x is, x is in your universe. So it's really not identifying anything together. It's just kind of leaving your algebra alone, although maybe I suppose if you're being a little, a little bit technical, you're going to notice that the universe now becomes the set of all singleton sets of A, so that A is in A. But this is a fairly straightforward isomorphism that you can construct by identifying the singleton set A with the element A which it contains. Okay, so nothing too crazy there. If I take A and quotient out by this, this, smallest, uh, this smallest equivalence relation, which also happens to be congruence, I'm just essentially going to get back A again, up to some nice isomorphism. Now, on the other hand, if I take A mod one, I'm going to get a trivial algebra because this equivalence relation is just the one that identifies any pair of elements X, Y, that X and Y are in A. And so this is, uh, this is going to identify every element of my algebra together to a single one. And so I'm just going to pick up a trivial algebraic structure with just a single element in its universe. And we already discussed those previously. Okay. So as always, there are some scary edge cases to think about. If you're looking at uh, at an empty at an empty algebraic structure, but I will leave those to you to grapple with if you're someone who likes to poke around at the at the edges a little bit. All right. So now, typically, many algebras have congruences other than zero and one, and I'll just start writing zero and one instead of zero a and one a because, as with many things, it gets tiring to keep writing the subscript. So there typically are other congruences out there which are more different or exciting than zero and one. Uh, trivial algebras have only one congruence, which is both zero and one. A non-trivial algebra with only the two congruences zero, one, zero and one, okay, and like maybe here I should say non-empty since I opened up the can of worms earlier and said, well, I suppose I'll allow empty algebras because you know it's not really fair to exclude them. But whoop. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we'll we'll generally not be too crazy about it. But um, just something to watch out for if you are going to go down the road of allowing those in, so that you can get those fancier properties, which I very vaguely alluded to but didn't actually discuss because they're too technical. So in any case. We have a non-trivial algebra with only the two congruences zero and one. We call those algebras simple algebras. And this is probably familiar from uh, group theory where in particular the classification of the finite simple groups had occupied a, a large amount of uh, effort over the course of the 20th century. And so uh, just as in group theory and also in the theory of rings and modules, in general, in universal algebra, we call an algebra with only these two congruences simple. 
So simple algebras are actually special cases of the more general building blocks of all algebraic structures. So these are special cases of that class of algebras, which I said played the same role that prime numbers do in arithmetic. Uh, we'll come back to them later, but this is a uh, sort of a first hint at what those, those sort of prime basic building blocks uh, are. Special, simple algebras are a special case of those. And so uh, we won't get into it yet, but that's a hint at what is coming and maybe what those special uh, algebraic structures will look like in general. All right. So now we can finally uh, take a look at something which we've already experienced before, uh, hopefully. So the preceding definitions of a kernel and a congruence uh, do actually generalize those of a kernel and a normal subgroup in group theory. So we have the following theorem, which relates these concepts. If we take G to be a group and take a normal subgroup N of G, we actually can define a congruence on G, theta N, so we'll call it, which consists of all of the pairs X, Y in G, so that, or in G squared, the pairs X, Y whose individual uh, entries come from G, so that y inverse x belongs to this normal subgroup. So for any x in the group G, we're actually going to have that the coset of x, uh, the coset um, containing x of n is nothing but the equivalence class of x under the uh, congruence theta n. Now, if I have a congruence theta of the group G viewed as an algebra in our sense in universal algebra, we actually have that E, uh, the equivalence class of E mod theta is the universe of a normal subgroup of G. So we can also go back from, a, from congruences to normal subgroups of the group G. So the map that takes a normal subgroup and maps it to that congruence theta N is actually an order preserving bijection from normal subgroups of G to congruences of G. And we can get an inverse map by sending the, uh, sending the congruence theta back to the, equivalent, the equivalence class of, it, of the identity element mod theta or back to the uh, subgroup of G which has that set as its universe if you wanna be really, really persnickety. Uh, okay, so uh, an order preserving here means that if N1 is, a subset of N2, where these are universes of our normal subgroups, then um, that's going to mean that theta, uh, theta N1 is also a subset of, uh, theta, of theta N2. And the idea here is that, um, so the idea here is that if I, um, if I quotient out by a bigger subgroup, I'm identifying more stuff together. And identifying more stuff together means I have to have more pairs in my, in my equivalence relation, theta and do. Okay, so we won't prove this, but this is also a good exercise to do to verify that we have actually precisely generalized here uh, the concept of a normal subgroup in group theory. And a similar argument can be made that uh, congruences also precisely generalize the concept of two-sided ideals in the theory of rings, even non-commutative rings, which is why I said two-sided. All right. Okay, so now at long last, we can finally prove a theorem, which is actually a named <laughs> theorem. Uh, so we can finally start proving the isomorphism theorems for all algebras simultaneously, which, <laughs> If I don't know if it's really the right choice, but if you had actually started off teaching people this way, you could just do them all at once and just be done with it. However, that might be too abstract, but it's not too abstract for you because you're watching this video. <laughs> so if we have a homomorphism from an algebra A to some other algebra B, whose kernel is theta, then there actually exists a unique embedding, h bar, which takes the quotient algebra A mod theta 
to the algebra B so that if I compose H bar with Q theta with that quotient map, then I get the original homomorphism H. When H is uh, surjective, we actually have the H bar as an isomorphism. And so that uh, homomorphic image B is nothing but the um, up to isomorphism is nothing but the quotient algebra A mod beta. Okay, and so for those of you who have uh, attended this particular party before, things are going to be very similar to what you have already seen. However, the advantage now is that we are doing them simultaneously for all possible algebras that one would consider, whether they're groups or rings or crazier things. Okay, so in order to start this off, we have to first of all, um, okay, well, we don't have to start with it, but, uh, but let's, let's do uniqueness. Let's do uniqueness first. If there was such a map H bar, let's show that it has to be defined a particular way. So in order to do this, let's start off with some element A, which is an A here. So I'll, I'll write an A here to denote that A is an element of this algebra but I'm not going to leave the epsilon. So little a, little a, um, oh no, I'm already losing my mind. All right, so I want an algebra, or I want uh, an element of, oh, okay, no, I'm, I am, I'm already, I'm already losing it, great sign, right? I'm just very excited and I need to just calm myself down and know that it will be okay. All right, so, um, so if I have an element A in my universe here, which is the way I want it to start, then there are two ways that I can compute uh, what H of A is. One is by applying H to A, and the other way is by applying, applying uh, H bar composed with Q theta to the element A. And so the reason why I know those are the same is because here I'm assuming that there does exist, um, that there does exist a, such an H bar so that the composite is equal to H. Now, I know how to compute Q theta of A because that's the equivalence class of A mod theta. So this is h bar of a mod theta. Okay, so now uh, I see that if there was such a function h bar, then h bar of a mod theta would have to be h of a. And so, okay, so then, uh, so then notice that this is a particular value that if h bar was a a well-defined function, it would have to attain that value h of a when we plugged in the equivalence class of a mod theta. So if there were such a function, all of its values would have to be specified since we just did this for an arbitrary a and that covers all possible cases of what a mod theta could be because every a belongs to some, um, or every equivalence class has some a in it. Okay, so that's the uniqueness part. If there was such a function, it would have to attain these values. Now let's try to define a function, h bar, which does this thing. So now by definition, h bar of a mod theta is h of a, which is what it would have to be. So now there's a natural question, which is, is this actually a well-defined function irrespective of whichever a we choose to represent this equivalence class? So let's suppose that A is related to B by theta. So let's suppose that A, A theta B or that A and B are in the same equivalence class mod theta. Okay, well in that case, we are going to compute that H bar of B mod theta, which should be the same thing because A mod theta and B mod theta are the same equivalence class. This is going to be H of B. Now, since uh, the kernel of 
uh, so the kernel of this homomorphism, H, is theta. And so A theta B is another way of saying that H of A is equal to H of B, because that's what it means to be in this, in this uh, congruence theta, which is, the, which is the kernel of this homomorphism. So these two guys are equal. So we already did the uniqueness part where we saw how we would have to define H bar. Then we looked at, well, if we did define H bar that way, is it well-defined? And it turns out, yes, it is, because theta is the kernel of this homomorphism. And so it doesn't matter which uh, representative we choose for an equivalence class to plug into H bar. OK, so now we have that H bar is a well-defined function, which does, uh, which is unique. So it exists, uh, and it's unique. And it, it satisfies this property that we want, where h bar composed of q theta is h. Uh, now we need to show that h, is, h bar is actually a homomorphism. So in order to do that, we uh, want to show that if we compute h bar of f in a mod theta, of a bunch of equivalence classes, a one mod theta through a n mod theta. Okay, so if we if we do this, we can either multiply everybody over in the quotient algebra and then send them over by h bar, or we can send them over individually and multiply them in the uh, codomain here, which is b. So h bar of a1 mod theta blah, 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 through h bar of a n mod theta, and I ran out of space in the corner. OK, so we want to show this. We want to show that this is true. Well, remember that I, h bar of h bar of I, a1 mod theta is just h of is just h of uh, h of a1. And so okay, so this this guy is actually f computed in b of h of a1 through h of a n by our assumption here that h bar composed with q theta is h. So now we'll use the fact that h is a homomorphism from a to b in order to see that this is the same as h of f computed in a of a1 through a n. All right, so now I know that this right-hand side is the same thing as h of f of a or f computed in a of a1 through a n. But now if I use this relationship again, the h of thing is h bar of thing mod theta, then I have that this is equal to h bar of f computed in a of a1 through a n mod theta, so it's h bar of that equivalence, that equivalence class. But remember what our definition of f computed in a mod theta was. By our definition, it is precisely the argument of h bar here. So this must be equal to this left-hand side. And so we have, in fact, shown that, that, h, uh, that h bar is a homomorphism of algebras from a mod theta to b. And so that's, that's really fantastic um, because we actually have established that there exists a unique homomorphism which does the thing that we want. Now, <laughs> OK, so now when, uh, when theta is surjective, uh, we want to show that h bar is actually an isomorphism. Oh, no, 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 no. 
I jumped ahead of myself. I also need to show that H bar is an embedding. So remember that an embedding is nothing but an injective homomorphism. And so I need to show that H bar is injective. So I'm going to clean up a little bit now in order to do that. Okay. So suppose that H bar of A mod theta is equal to H bar of B mod theta. So uh, I want to show that if this is the case, then A mod theta actually has to be equal to B mod theta. So, well, I know that uh, I know that this side is equal to H of A, and I know that this side is equal to H of B. But now, but now, uh, if H of A is equal to H of B, that means that A B is in the kernel of H but that's theta, and so that means that um, A mod theta is the same thing as B mod theta. So that shows that H bar is injective as a function, which is what it means to be. A, an injective homomorphism, by our definition, is an embedding. So H bar is an embedding. So at this point, we've shown that if we have any homomorphism with some kernel, that we can always factor that homomorphism by first doing a surjective uh, quotient homomorphism from A to A mod theta. And then we have an injective uh, embedding, as it's called, an embedding from uh, the quotient algebra A mod theta to the codomain B. So we've established all of that so far for general algebraic structures. And there is absolutely no use anywhere in this argument, notice, of anything having to do with whether operations are associative or things have inverses or identities or any of that, none of that matters here. And we were still able to prove that entire result. Now, finally, when H is surjective, we want to see that H bar is an isomorphism. However, this is the easiest part because if H bar is an injective homomorphism, which is also surjective, then H bar is a bijective homomorphism and we call those isomorphisms. And so that's that last step, which is basically just from the definitions. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm losing my mind. That is not, that is not just from the definitions. I'm being, I'm being very silly. Uh, I was so proud of myself too. All right, here we go. The real last step. When H is surjective, we have the H bar as an isomorphism. This is not totally immediately obvious from the definitions. I have to watch myself. Now, okay, so now, uh, so now if H is surjective, that means that if we, so the goal is to show that H bar is actually surjective. So maybe I'll just, uh, maybe I'll just clear some stuff out again. Let's do that. Okay. So I want to show that H, I want to show that H bar is surjective because if I can show that H bar is surjective, then by all the other stuff that I said so far, I know that I know that uh, H bar will be actually an isomorphism. So I just have to show that H bar is surjective in the case that H is surjective. So in order to see that, let's pick some little b in B. So uh, assuming that H is surjective, which is denoted by these uh, double arrows here, like for the quotient map then if H is surjective, then we know that there's some A in A so that B is actually equal to H of A. But if B is equal to H of A, then B is equal to H bar of A mod theta by this relationship that we have over here. So since B is H bar of A mod theta, that means there's some element of A mod theta, namely little a mod theta, so that H bar of that element is, is uh, little b. And that's precisely what it means for H bar to be surjective. Now, since H bar is surjective and also injective and also a homomorphism, H bar is an isomorphism in the case that H itself is a surjective map 
which it need not be in general. All right, so that's it for the first, uh, well, as some people call it, the first, the first homomorphism theorem, or the, or the first isomorphism theorem, or the homomorphism theorem, or the fundamental homomorphism theorem, or whatever it is that you would like to call this thing. But whatever it is, it's, uh, it's, it's been quite entertaining to go through. And as we've seen, again, it can be done simultaneously for any algebra that you would like. You don't have to specify any particular properties at all. OK. So now that we have that, we can move on to generating congruences. Just as we discussed the subuniverse uh, generated by a set previously, we can also examine congruences generated by a set. So if I have an algebra A and a collection big theta of congruences of A, the intersection of all of those con congruences is actually a congruence of A. And the proof of this statement is quite similar to that of the corresponding proposition for subuniverses. So I'm not going to go through it, but it's very similar. And now I don't want to alarm you, but if you are following along more closely, then you might have a question, which is what happens when, uh, when big theta is actually the empty set? How do I take the intersection of an empty collection of sets? And so there is a more technical answer, but it turns out that it won't be useful or interesting to us <laughs> until we get to a later part of the series of talks. And so for now, I'm just gonna say, don't worry about that. But it is actually interesting if you look at the intersection of the empty collection of subsets too. We just have to be a little bit careful on how we actually define that. So for now, don't let it bother you if you're someone who is bothered by such things. We can uh, consider the smallest congruence of A containing a set of pairs, just like we considered the smallest subuniverse of A uh, containing a set of elements of our universe before. So we're going to uh, denote by con of A the set of all congruences of the algebra A. And the congruence generated by a set is nothing but the intersection of all of the congruences which contain that set of pairs of things in A as a subset. And so this is very much analogous to the definition of the uh, subuniverse generated by a set of elements, except now we start off with a collection of pairs, new, and we obtain from that collection of ordered pairs, uh, well, a, uh, a congruence as it turns out, because the previous proposition tells us that the congruence generated by new in the algebra A is actually a congruence of A. Uh, and so again, we don't need to worry about that uh, situation where the collection of uh, congruence as big theta is empty because we always have that uh, that one is a congruence of any algebra A and uh, one contains all possible pairs and so nu is a subset of one so this intersection uh, is an intersection of at least one set which is the the uh, relation one the equivalence relation or congruence one. And so we're just taking that full subset A squared, which contains everything, and intersecting it with other things which contain new. So uh, we have a non-empty collection and no matter how many things which contain new, we intersect with. So we, we, have, uh, we have new down here. We have our big uh, full set one, which is A squared. And then we'll intersect it with a bunch of other things, which also contain new. But no matter how many things we intersect with, the resulting congruence is always going to have new as a subset. Even though new itself can just be any relation, it doesn't have any binary relation. It doesn't have to be an equivalence relation or a congruence or anything. All right. So. Again, instead of taking this top-down viewpoint where I start out with my new and then I intersect a whole bunch of things in order to get some, uh, say the square got here, which would be my congruence generated. So this, this square is gonna represent like my congruence generated by new. There's also a bottom-up way to view the same thing where I 
start off with new and then I keep adding stuff to it until I eventually get this entire congruence generated by new. And I can do that by taking unions of bigger and bigger sets of things that I define carefully enough. So uh, before we do that, it'll be convenient to have some more notation. We're going to write bold A, or maybe A with a bar under it, or maybe we'll just write A if we're being lazy, to indicate that A is actually a tuple, A1 through AN, for some A1 through AN in the set A. Now, if we have some uh, binary relation on A, which doesn't have to satisfy any special properties, we're going to write the tuple A is related by new to the tuple B. Uh, without this N here, that N is a horrible typo that I realize now I don't want, <laughs> uh, to indicate that each of, the, each of the individual entries, AI, are related to their corresponding partner, BI. So we're going to write A new B, when what we mean is that A1 is related by new to B1, A2, new B2, and so forth, down to AN, new BN. So that's just shorthand for this situation, which we've been considering a lot, actually. So we can reformulate the substitution property uh, as saying that A theta B implies that f of a theta f of b for any tuples a and b and any basic operation f. So notice that f of bold a is by definition the same thing as f of a1 through an. So this is some nice shorthand that will help us out a lot in the future. Now we can give our bottom up description of the congruence of A generated by the set new. So if we have some algebra A with a collection of basic operations F and new is a subset of A squared, then we're going to define new naught to be new union with new smile, <laughs> which is uh, the converse of new, and then uh, union with the zero relation on A. And uh, for each natural number N, we're gonna define the, the bigger collection new N to be what we get when we take the relative product of the previous one with itself, and then union with what we get when we apply uh, f in the corresponding components of two vectors which are related, or two tuples which are related by nu n, nu n minus one. Wow, I'm really eating it on the indices today <laughs> because it has to be nu n minus one because those are that would be saying that the entries in A and B are related in the previous level. Obviously, I can't use new n because I'm trying to define new n right now. All right, so in that case, that's a little bit of a messier definition than what we had for the subuniverse generated by, um, by a set, but uh, we do still have with this construction that the congruence of A generated by new is the union of all of these new n that get bigger and bigger and bigger. Now, the argument for that and its basic structure is quite similar to the one that we outlined for the subuniverse, uh, the bottom up construction of a subuniverse generated by a set um, previously. However, there's a lot more technical detail involved in the manipulation of, uh, of these relations according to those operations we defined on relations at the beginning of the talk today. And so I believe that will put me at a much, much longer amount of time than I wanted this talk to be. So I am going to leave it to you to investigate further if you find it exciting to see precisely what that calculation and argument is. Okay, so accepting that that is the case, um, we are going to have special uh, types of congruences which we're interested in. So Congruences, which can be written as the congruence generated by new for some finite set new, are called finitely generated, which seems pretty reasonable to me. Uh, we're going to be particularly interested in congruences of, of the form congruence generated by the set containing a single pair x and y. So this pair x, y is a single element of 
a squared, where a is the universe of our algebra, and we're going to call those principal congruences, we'll actually inter, inter, <laughs> indicate those principal congruences by uh, congruence generated by x, y, rather than this messier notation, which puts us into a horrible, messy nest of brackets that we can't find our way out of. All right, so that's all for today. I uh, thank you for going on this journey with me so far, and I hope that seeing our first uh, somewhat big theorem, although not one of the super big theorems, uh, is especially encouraging since we've built up so many definitions and so much notation at this point. It's nice to see it finally paying off and getting really clean results that cover all of those ones that you saw separately in a basic algebra course or introduction. All right, I thank you again and have a wonderful rest of your day.